Welcome to the Fancier Brew Podcast. I'm Andy, the Northern Diver. In this series, I'll be discussing adventure, conservation, and progression in scuba diving with some really interesting and inspirational divers that you might or not have heard of. The podcast is supported by Northern Diver International and you, the listener, through Patreon. So grab yourself a brew and enjoy this week's episode. Okay then, Kristen Fasolis, welcome to Fancy Brew Podcast. Hi. Have you, Thanks have for you got yourself me. a brew? I do, yes. Here it what is. What are you supping? Chamomile tea. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's a bit late in the day for caffeine for me. <laughs> well, I, I've been on caffeine free PG tips for quite a while now. And for the first week, I had a proper downer. My head was pounding and all sorts of stuff like that. And I was saying to me, Mrs. Oh, this headache's killing me. I've probably got COVID. And she was laughing her head off for about a week. And then she told me. And I was, I was like almost symptoms. devastated. Yeah. <laughs> but it, honest to God, it tastes exactly the same. I sleep, and this is not an advert for PG Tips. I've even asked them to try and sponsor a podcast and they've just ignored me. <laughs> but um, I sleep like solid now. I can have as many cups of tea. I suppose the downside is I have one sugar. So. Oh, come on, you're speaking to me. I'm going to try and get you out of that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Nice segue into who are you and what do you do? <laughs> well, yeah, as you say, my name's Kristen Fasolis um, and I am the scuba fitness coach. So I started off as a personal trainer many years ago, about eight to ten years ago. Um, I used to do one-to-one sessions in the gym with people or park or wherever. Um, however, with PT, when you're doing one-to-one sessions, you are working with people when they are not at work so I'm working from 5 a.m to 7 a.m maybe an hour or two at lunch and then again from 7 p.m to possibly 10 p.m uh, which meant I wasn't seeing my other half which I'm sure some people would be quite happy with but um, <laughs> <laughs> for us it wasn't really sustainable um, so I moved my business online um, I started to see a bit of a gap in the market because I'm a, I'm a diver myself I'm not um an expert diver I'm not a professional diver I'm a recreational diver and I could see yeah. how fitness and diving can go hand in hand and benefit a lot of people from things I've seen in the past or read you read articles about fatalities unfortunately and why they've come about um so I kind of wanted to put the two together so I sort of um work as a scuba fitness coach as a side hustle thoroughly enjoy it um and have a day job as well what do you do as a day job Oh, I'm an IT project manager. Let's move swiftly on then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've not got any prep to ask you about being an IT manager. <laughs> Although I, used, I did used to work in IT myself, but we'll, we'll move straight on there. So as a diver then, what, what, what sort of diving have you done? Where's your sort of favourite place? What kind of setup do you wear? Kit configuration, all that kind of stuff. Um, well, I started diving back in 2006. Uh, my husband actually bought it for me for um, a present, mainly just to force me into it because we were going travelling and he really yeah. wanted to to do the diving because he'd heard quite a bit about it. Um, so we had the training here in England, which I won't lie, kind of put me off <laughs> to, <laughs> to begin with. I'm going did you do it in a dry suit or do you do it in a wetsuit? No, a wetsuit, semi-dry, semi-dry. Wow. So still, my mate, it's, my, well my mate calls them semi-wet because you're kind of <laughs> yeah. wet. I might as well have been in a swimming costume for all I care. Really? It, was, it was freezing. Um, so much so that when I was doing one of my courses, I had to be taken out because I was near hypothermic at one yeah. point. So we had to do the course another time. So yeah, so I've dived in zero visibility cold lakes. But I will say that's probably made me a, a better diver because yeah. if I can cope in those conditions, I'll be fine anywhere else. Totally from that, agree. we went um, and we went travelling around the world. So we've dived from places from Vietnam to... Um, Australia to Galapagos um, yeah so obviously lovely beautiful visibility rather than just you know 30 centimeters and um, yeah I've dived in lots of different currents um, by the battery surface or, or below yeah um, regarding kit configuration I mean you know I'm not I'm not overly massively into all of that kind of thing I've got my first wing though recently the past couple of years brilliant you, yeah, you certainly got a thumbs up from me. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Um, but I, I am a recreational diver and I am not ashamed to say I'm a warm water diver. So yeah. I will dive when I go on holidays, but I'm not a UK diver anymore because I just can't stand the cold. <laughs> me either. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. 
so just before we started recording, you said you, you, your other half, he's just bought himself a rebreather. Is it, does it not take your fancy at all? Yeah, it does, actually. It does intrigue me. But taking it diving in England doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I changed my dry suit just before Christmas, when just before, as I was starting my rebreather training, to a neoprene dry suit. And um, it's from Northern Dive, which is around the corner. So big up to them for the support. But it made so much difference because I've been diving in a trilaminate, so a really thin one mm. for a number of years and always whinging and harping on about how cold I was. And as soon as I put that neoprene one, it made such a difference. So it's a good five mil thick anyway. I've got my hands are dry because I've got dry gloves. There's plenty of circulation around my feet because I'm not wearing rock boots anymore. So, that, yeah. you know, you, you're not sort of hampered with that circulation, not getting in and out. It's not as tight. And instantly warmer so i guess if you were to dive that in the summer when the viz is particularly worse anyway it um it might be better for you but depends whether you That's want true. to go and see zero viz or not <laughs> if you can't even see your hand in front of your face it's not good for he does a lot of deep diving as well so i wouldn't be going with him nah. unless i did all the same sort of training as him but kent oh yeah so you, mm. you're other side aren't you then so yeah line. so where'd, where'd he go diving uh Bob Star Chepstow and right, off the yeah. south coast. Yeah, cool. Um, we went to what's that one on the coast of off the north of Ireland? Um Malinhead, is it? Yeah, Malinhead. Awesome. Um and he's going Scapper, I think, in 2022. Is he? Yeah. Nice. What pl- really what trips have you got planned? Have you got anything yourselves? Like together? We we were going to the Red Sea in July, which got put off from this year, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> we go to have you been to Master Chagra? No. Oh, look it up. It's it's a Red Sea diving safari, and they've got three yeah. e- eco villages. So you can stay right. in tents, or you can stay in little huts. Awesome. But there's yeah. nothing else around. It is literally a diving setup. That's it. There's no like swimming pool. There's no hotel. It's just Wicked. you literally get up, you have your dives, and it's not too far from Elphinstone, so you can jump on a little rib to Elphinstone. No kids. Mm-hmm. Get in. <laughs> I, uh, we don't have kids, so we don't have to worry. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't. I do, but the, the mine are all like sixteen and above now, so it's all good. Oh, okay. But um, we, we're going to Red Sea in June, so we've got oh. it's Elphinstone. I don't know how you pronounce it. Is it Daleidus or something like that? And um, oh, da- yeah, Daleidus or something. Are you going to Liverpool? Summer. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. Blue O Two again. But we went in 2019 with a group from mostly of them are a military RAF uh, that I I kind of knew. And then we got invited along, which was good. Didn't know many people, but then obviously got to know them all. So it's another boatload of people who we know. So it'd be kind of ace. That would be and good. And again, again, no frigging kids running around. Get yeah. Out. Oh, I love a liverboard. Really love it. My first liverboard was in Egypt, but it was when there was, I think it was 20, 2016 or something like that. There was a lot, there was lots of issues and not many people were flying to Egypt. I can't remember what the issues were now. Um, and, uh, oh God, what's the name of that famous shipwreck in, in Egypt? This will go on. Yes. Totally doesn't begin with why, does it? Um, no. Yeah, so our liverboard stopped there, and we were the only boat. Get out. The only boat. <laughs> Mega. There was no one else around. My husband had died that, that ship a few times. He said you wouldn't be able to see the sea through the boats no. normally. He's not yeah. kidding. Well, we, only we only dived it twice last year or the year before. The first dive, we were very late getting there. We'd steamed through the night to get there for whatever reason. So when we got on, there was half a dozen boats all the way around it, and it was beautiful viz. It really was. It was people mm. cutting around on DPVs and stuff like that. Mm. But then the second day, so we came out, had lunch, went back in, and everyone had buggered off. But the viz had just gone. It, honestly, from oh, no. from the the sort of front of the ship, you couldn't actually see the bow. I so, you know, like um, oh, shame from the bridge. Sorry, you couldn't actually see yeah. the bow. It was horrendous. Such oh, a no. shite dive, the second one. But oh, shame. Um, I had a rubbish experience because the viz was yeah. so poor. The viz was so poor. So we were in the cage. Me and my yeah. friend were at one end and my husband was up the other end. So we were all down underneath. They told us to go down. We come back up. My husband's like, oh, my God, that was amazing. We saw nothing. Nothing from the really? other end of the cage. No, wouldn't have, wouldn't have known there was a shark there. Not at yeah. all. And it was that and it was that bad. The next time they said go down, the husband thought it was really funny to go down and come underneath us and grab our feet. <laughs> <laughs> Ace. 
That kind of happened to us in the Red Sea. And then um, if you dive the Brothers Islands. No. So we were in there and it was the, you're going to see a, um, a white tip oceanic. Definitely. You're going to see loads of them. So we dived. There's um, uh, a big wreck on the front of like the northern tip of it. And it's, it's on a big slope and it drops off into a million miles of deep or whatever. So we dived that and swam back. And that's when we were going to see them. Mm-hmm. And this one shark just followed us nice and slow and buggered off. So me and Ali got out thinking, oh, that's it. Because oh, we no. were the first ones out and everyone else was just dilly-dallying, faffing around, taking shots with a camera. Another load of them turned up. So we we're on the boat having a cup of tea, kitten, of fully kitting off. Yeah, loads of them rocked up. They're so quite everyone's solitary, in the water. aren't they? Yeah, I'm like, fucking oh, hell. I missed them. So <sighs> this year, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my rebreather and I'll be last out the water on every dive now. God, they'll come up pretty close when you've got your rebreather on, won't they? I, even right in, in our local dive site, like the one at quarries near us, I was diving on my own two weeks ago, a week before Christmas it was. My mate never turned up, so I went in on my own. I am a solo diver, just put out that in case they end up playing this <laughs> <Judging>. out. <laughs> so I went in anyway, and it does make so much difference. You can sneak up on stuff. So there was sturgeon feeding on the bottom, you know, with the little mouth distending down, mm-hmm. chewing up stuff out the bottom. And I just snuck up on it and just lied there, just like that, watching it, got my GoPro out. And it didn't really mind until Dickhead here got his torch and shone it in his eye and it realised <laughs> it was being watched, so it buggered off. But it... Yeah, my husband says they'll swim like and hit his hit his oh, head, just like... Yeah, yeah. See, that they, makes they me really right... want to try it. <laughs> they always I, have I... a right scabby, bulbous nose because they just <laughs> go almost as chuff and just swimming into everything. That's what makes me want to try it because I, I, I love the feeling of diving and I like the the animals that's yeah. what i go for but like, my husband likes all the wrecks and everything like that but i love the animals so he's like that... rebreather is for you because they'll come yeah. like right up honestly i said i was more like him but my missus is more like you and i guess maybe that's the the little boy in in us men generally we see that as the playground yeah you know that's underwater so we go and dick around in there and actually it's if you look at it it's just a, a load of old scrap in it that it's just a load of <laughs> tin corridors with full of rust there's nothing there is there it's not like you're going to go in and find anything because you hunt out the pillars. wildlife in the wreck <laughs> yeah yeah so me getting a camera in so many ways she's more happy to dive with me now because i actually want to look at stuff and i'll be hanging around stuff instead of just bomb bursting around trying to find the next little swim through i'm actually learning more my buoyancy controls just so much better because you kind of have to be steadied yeah and i don't want to be lying on no idea. reef no. So everything for me as a diver has got better as soon as I picked up a camera. Um, One of my um, best experiences is it's on my Instagram, actually. And it was actually a testament to the, my fitness as well. Um, my husband and his, a couple of friends went off to Elphinstone in the morning from this Master, yeah. Master Chagra village. And me and, this, me and this other guy wasn't fancy in the rib. I'm not very good on sort of rib like that. And it was a bit choppy. So he said, oh, let's go and dive on the on the house reef. So anyway, we uh, we plopped on the rib. They took us out round the sort of north reef, and then you sort of make your way back, and you can pop up, yeah. and the boat will come and get you again. And um, so we went down, and there was quite a current. There was quite a current down there, and um, we were fighting it at first to go along, to aim to head back towards the village. So that, and unfortunately, the current was going the other way. So anyway, we're, we're sort of fighting it, going along, and it's it's getting to the point where I'm thinking, cool, like I'm actually feeling quite. It's quite laboured now. I haven't yeah. seen a single bloody fish that's interested me yet. <laughs> so anyway, so we're, we're kind of long, and there was this fine, lonely little batfish. And I sort of looked at my my uh, buddy, and I was like, should we just go with the current this go? Because the boat will come and pick you up anyway once you put your yeah. SMB up. So like, yep, sod it. So we turned around and just went with the current, flowed in it. It was quite fast. It was quite enjoyable. But anyway, it got to the got to the point where I thought, we've actually probably gone quite far. Let's stick the SMB up and up we go. So we, as the SMB is going up, we're obviously still going with the current. So no idea how far we'd sort of travelled. But anyway, we popped up only for the, the surface. The waves now were actually pretty high to the point where we're sort of in the, the bottom of it. And the top of yeah. the wave, we couldn't we couldn't see Jeez. Our, our village. And I was like, oh, my God. So I was like, right. So we sort of just, I said, right. he was quite a new diver. So I was like, right, let's just, let's just chill out let's stick the sausage up as high as we possibly can you know wave it oh. around make sure we've got air in our you know in our Easy vest and everything much. and let's just wait yeah. 
anyway we were waiting for a long time but they're a really good operation there like you have to write on the board what time you're going out and what time you're expected yeah. to be back and what reef you're on and what your locker number is um so and they you have to rub it off when you're there so they've obviously noticed that we haven't come back by the time we should have come back checked that our kit isn't in our locker so they will obviously yeah. start coming out but we must have been floating in those waves for well, it felt like five hours, but it probably about 20, 30 minutes, you know, quite a long time yeah, to be floating on the surface. Too long, isn't it? Too long. Anyway, I'm, I'm facing the village waiting for the boat to come if I can see them, but you can't see anything. I'm thinking, God, this is horrendous. I'm getting a bit nervous now. I'm getting knackered, even just trying to sort of, you've got air in your jacket, but you're still trying to keep afloat, yeah. you know? And you're getting a bit concerned. And I think, God, I hope he's all right. I'm like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry. You know, just smiling. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> see he's concerned and then but I'm holding on to his arm you know just so we stay together because we would have just separated so now I'm facing the village and he's facing the other way and sort of as cool as a cucumber as calm as anything he went to me there's a fin I mean sorry what he was like there's oh, a fin okay. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> there whale shark I went wow what? he was like whale shark literally he might as well have just seen a batfish again it was that like really? not faced by it he was Jeez. too busy waiting for the boat I was like, oh my god so i went under and there was this massive whale shark just with us just following us like, yeah yeah it did the mouth oh, was literally i mean i could have kissed it it came right up close to me i've got a photo wow. of its mouth is literally like that in front of me and oh, it was bro. there with us for about five ten minutes and then we then heard the boat and it, it swam off Oh. I mean, immediately I didn't care that I was floating and I, I had no energy left, like literally none to get me back onto the boat. So they had to lift me with all my kit yeah. onto the boat and, I, and I'm a fit person. This is, this is it. You know, if I didn't have that mm. fitness, I would have been absolutely shot. Yeah. You're floating, but still it's very uncomfortable. Mm. And um, they're like, oh my God, are you all right? Are you all right? I was like, yeah, I just saw a whale shark. Well, you <laughs> like, just ruined it by coming right. saving us. <laughs> <laughs> Could have come 20 minutes ago, couldn't it? Oh, <laughs> That's it. Goody. But that was an amazing experience. But obviously, they went out to Elphinstone to see all the sharks and the hammerheads and the yeah. you know, oceanic white tip. And um, yeah, saw nothing. <laughs> Devastating. I was in the back. Gets him back. Gets him back from <laughs> yeah. when you're in, the, in the, down at South Africa, doesn't it? In the <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm, I can't wait. I mean, certainly, if, if, if I do end up taking my rebreather, which I hope to, and there's no reason why my, my missus she'll dive uh, a twin set no problem mm -hmm. and certainly as long as we stay within the confines of the hour surface to surface and there's no decompression we can dive it out there they can support us and stuff and a mate of mine who trained on it the year before last for 2019 he's taking his so we could kind of buddy up there's no reason why we can't and i, I hope that it will make such a difference that like you said when when that boat rocked up and the whale shark heard it, it just buggered off i'm hoping yeah we get the opposite effect so we shall see yeah I've, that's all i've heard is positive vibes about them so i'm pretty excited just oh, we need brilliant. to get rid of all this shite that's going on at the minute and then we can crack on with the world can't we i'm just getting on my nerves now <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> oh well mm. yeah so you've had um looking through you know your sort of social media and stuff you've had quite a few articles written or you've written them for different sort of magazines yeah. and stuff haven't you how did that come about yeah, um, well, when I first started look, uh, researching into fitness and diving and the correlation between them, um, I looked for some experts in the industry and I went to see uh, Dr. Ollie Firth, actually, at the London Dive Chamber, which unfortunately right. is, is no more. Um, it's just the Midlands, I think now, Midlands yeah. Diving Chamber. Um, so I went up to see him and sort of just talked to him about my, my thoughts and my feelings and wanted to get his feedback on it. Um, and then he sort of made the suggestion that because him and also uh, Michael, who wrote from the Midlands Diving Chamber, they wrote, they write Tanked Up magazine together. Yeah. So he made the suggestion that he worked with me for three months on a program that I would put him on. And then he could write a, an article about that in Tanked Up magazine. And that, so that's right. how that came about. Um, and I've written a few articles for um, TDI, SDI. Mega. So yeah, I'm just, nice. doing, is that Dr. Mike? Yes. Um, that's, I met him I, when I had my um, HSC medical. I think it was like the end of September. I'm just looking now, see if it's in. Yeah, I didn't meet Mike. Yeah, it is. Um, face to face, but, but it was it was Ollie Firth I met face to face. 
Yeah, um, I did meet Ollie, but looking at it now, yeah, it is Dr. Mike there, yeah. And uh, so how did you get on writing for them then, the TDI stuff? Is it is it something you enjoyed or well, not so much? Was it an easy thing for you? Yeah, it was absolutely fine, yeah. Um, you know what? I can't remember what it's about now. I think they might, I can't remember if I reached to them or they reached out to me following on Thanked Up magazine. I, I honestly can't remember, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed putting those big, big articles for them. I, uh, I've never heard of Tanked Up magazine before, to be honest, until I, um, until I came across your profile and we started chatting and you sent me a few links and stuff. But um, I, I guess it's going to make quite an interesting read now because there's quite a lot of samey stuff out there, articles and stuff, isn't there? So... If he's talking mm. perhaps more on a technical sort of aspect, which I'll have to look into, but the links will obviously be in the bottom of the, the, the podcast description. So did you did you learn much? Did you discover much from chat for them conversations? Well, yeah, I mean, they, they were at the, at the time, they were actually upping their pass rate because there were a lot of, a lot of fatalities, a lot of accidents amongst divers in the UK. So they're yeah. actually upping their their pass rate so um, to make it harder yeah. for people to get through yeah yep which i found right. quite interesting um yeah because uh, you know unfortunately a lot of the time diving is seen for the most part i'm sort of generalizing here for the most part you know quite relaxing sport and in good conditions you know it's a little effort um so probably a little fitness once once you're yeah. in the water sometimes obviously you're carrying heavy kit to the water um but it's it's those occasions, those times when it is difficult. You know, you, you get stuck in a certain condition. You have mm. to, you know, do a rescue, a rescue in a difficult condition. That's when mm. it really becomes important, especially if you're an instructor and you've got students that go up, down, side to side, yeah. wherever they're going. <laughs> and you're trying to keep up with them. You're, you're putting your body right through it. See, for me, Touch wood now, I, I've not come across one of those that's been too sort of physically demanding, but it, I find it quite mentally um, consuming. You know, I can quite quickly, certainly on a new course, like I just mentioned before, I've just done that rebreather course. I can find that where I've, I've sort of hit my limit of, of stuff that I can deal with. You know, I can't then add on another task. So if it did get to the point where I'm already sort of task loaded anyway, and then there's another drama I've got to deal with or another task that someone set me. I'll be like, nah, <laughs> just take me reg out and just <laughs> flake out. So and I, I come from quite a fit background. You know, I've always trained. I was a physical training instructor in the army. So I understand the need to be physically fit for the demands of your job. But I guess you could look around car parks on dive, set, dive sites and you could suggest that people, People don't always know or don't always live that kind of life. Mm -hmm. So I'd kind of like to, if we can sort of develop a way on this now, you know, sort of put people in the light of how they can make simple changes to their lives without taking too much business away from you, certainly throwing some back at you, hopefully, but how people can make very simple lifestyle changes to improve their own fitness levels. But I think it always starts with just being motivated. The hardest bit in the morning for us going out on our bikes, because we get out about half six, seven, is just getting out of bed and then putting your kit on. Once you've got your kit on and you're out the door, no matter how bad the weather is, it's not actually that bad. Because in an hour, you're going to be home and in the hot shower and have a brew down your neck. So yeah. how do you go about, do you, do you have like any, any, any skills at motivating people better than I? I think it's setting yourself a challenge or a target and sometimes not doing it on your own. So if you have a friend that you can do something with or set a challenge, obviously <laughs> at the moment, there's only so many, many people you can meet outside, there yeah. are no gyms, you know, there's, there's only certain things you can do at the moment. But um, something we do, I'm doing with my friends at the moment is for January, we've set a challenge that for the, for within the month of January, we all are to cover the distance of a marathon. Now we're all different fitness levels. So whether yeah. someone wants to walk the distance of a marathon, they want to run or they want to do a combination or halfway through, they're thinking, well, actually I might try a bit of running. I might change that and do my running yeah. challenge. You know, it's not a competition who gets it the fastest, but we all have to complete it. Um, and even for me today, before, before I came on here, I looked out, I was like, oh, it's dark, it's raining. Oh, no. I've got to do my run. I've got to do it. Yeah. Let's, let's go. And you're right. After you've been out there for 30 seconds, you honestly don't mind. And you feel so much better 
coming yeah. back for it. So I think it's really important to to have a goal, not necessarily to become, you know, your peak physical fitness. That can't be your no. goal. It's too high. Just yeah. little step by step, tiny little changes can make all the difference. I used to run loads and um, I can't anymore. I bust my knee. But anyway, um, I used it used to be almost like what I would imagine going for counselling was. You know, I could put my headphones in with a, a really sort of up-tempo, I, I quite like sort of house and dance music, that kind of thing anyway. Mm-hmm. So I'll put that kind of music on and I'll just, I could run for a good hour or two and just listen and plod on. You know, I'm not sprinting up the street or anything, but I'm just plodding on. And my mind would almost go into like a, a daydream. You know, I'd just forget the world and I'd switch off. And that's probably the worst thing that's happened to me. Now that I can only sort of cycle or swim, I, I perhaps can't listen to the same sort of music and get the same sort of, it's not a stimulus, is it? It's, it's almost the opposite. I'm, the release, I'm not getting that at all. So that's where I find it perhaps less motivating to get out on my bike in the morning when it's dark. I can't mm-hmm. have headphones in because I might miss the traffic and we're going down country roads that are genuinely pitch black. So I need to have my wits about me. Someone might jump out and go, boo. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it depends what kind of release you're looking for. If you're looking for the, the loud banging music for you to kind of release the stress... Mm. or are you looking for being out in nature and just getting that fresh air and yeah space you know having the space in your brain just to think about oh that's a pretty bird or you know little things yeah. like that it's, it depends what you're looking for in a release and it doesn't always have to be the same thing each time mm. you know nah. come on people can listen to your podcast when they're going for a run they are <laughs> <laughs> they'll fall asleep <laughs> they'll, fall asleep. <laughs> they'll, they'll just flake out halfway around <laughs> good idea yeah 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 that'd be a good idea um but i say i certainly feel more motivated now i've got out because my wife's been doing it all through the initial lockdown the, the one in november that we had and and carried on so i kind of as long as i can keep her in front of me because she's better at it than i am i feel like i'm trying to catch her up so it's a push mm. for me that's where my motivation is to beat her and and or at least keep up with her. You're not competitive at all then, clearly. No, I mean, I, I mean <laughs> I've, I've got gin, uh, ginger in my jeans, as you can see. I'm an Urian. So everything is a fight with me and I have to win it. And it's horrendous. I, it's a crush I have to bear. So You're right. Uh, everyone, well. like you just saying, that's your motivation. Everyone has their own motivation. Um, and yeah. everyone, I mean, there is so many different forms of exercise out there. You know, you don't, mm. you hate running, you hate walking. You don't have to do that at all. If you feel like doing it, go for it. You might end up loving it, but, you know, do yoga, do kettlebells, do skipping. You know, there yeah. are so many different options out there and everyone's got so much time on their hands at the moment as well. You're not kidding. Uh, you know what I did? You know, the little press up bars that you can buy, mm-hmm. There's like two little grip handles, aren't they? And like two pieces on the bottom. I bought some of them last year and never, ever did they come out of the box I was tidying up after Christmas and found them and thought, right, I'm going to do something with these. Finally, <laughs> it wasn't put them in the bin. I've, we've got like a, <laughs> a spare bedroom with just like a wardrobe or whatever in there. So that's where I go in every day to get dressed or get me, get a towel or deodorant or whatever. So I put them on the floor and I've made this rule. Every time I go in, I'm going to go in to and do press ups to failure. So I've gone from the first couple of days, every time I went in, I was just doing about 10. I've got up to 20. There were only two weeks into the new year. So I've doubled every time I go in my max effort, you know, so I'm going to keep that up and just they're, they're in the corner. So not in anybody's way, but and I found myself a couple of times. Oh, I don't want to go in there because I'm going to have to do them, but <laughs> I've, I've tried to go, you. no. Yeah. If I cheat once I'll cheat again, rather than, you know, if I just go in and just bang them out, it's only five minutes. It's not even that it's probably 30 seconds, Yeah. but do them properly, do them strict, you know, trying to keep my core nice and tight, straight arms to bent 90 degree elbows as, as you should. And it's better than doing no press ups, isn't it? Yeah. And you know what? You've hit the nail on the head there. Doing something is always going to be better than doing nothing. And you never, well, I've never heard of anyone say that they regret any kind of workout at all. You always feel better after yeah. you've had a workout, um, obviously, unless there's no injuries. But <laughs> yeah. also, another thing you, you picked up on there was habit, building habits, making it habitual. So every time you go in that room, you do that. Um, you know, if someone, if you're going to walk to the shops, maybe take the long route rounds at the moment, get as much mm-hmm. air as you can. It's just increasing things that you do constantly, but make it a habit. Yeah. Well, so there's certainly the start of lockdown, there's a, a girl lives across the road who we're quite friendly with. She doesn't want to ride. 
like she doesn't want to get a bike out. Mm-hmm. I don't think she ever rode. That's probably why. Uh, she doesn't want to run. But and she was classed as like um, you know she had to shield. I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but she was off for the entirety of the initial lockdown. You know the long one. So she walked. Her kids had to go to school. Mm-hmm. Um, or when her husband was home, she'd go out as soon as he got in or whatever. And she walked and she was out for a couple of hours. She's lost loads of weight. She was never a big girl, but you can now notice that she has lost a lot. You know, she's dressing differently. She seems a bit more confident. You know, she's, she's got that little Timothy thing going on with her, you know, flicking it back as she's walking down the street. But just that, her own mental health, I suppose, has took a boost because when she looks in the mirror or she's getting dressed, she just feels so much better. And and then if you if you put that into scuba diving, the downside of losing a bit of weight is you might have to get a different dry suit. Well, so there's a couple of thousand pounds down the pan. But there's always someone who'll buy it. But equally, you feel just less breathless and and life's just that bit easier, isn't it? And if you're walking with a spring in your step as well, carrying that twin set's not half as bad, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. You're just not going to overexert yourself, which is obviously really important in diving because you will. You don't want to overexert yourself because that can cause you quite a few, a few problems. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine I was a new customer now and obviously off the back of this, somebody might well come and look you up on, on Facebook or Instagram or whatever and go to your website. What kind of plans do you sort of run for people? What, how does it work? Uh, they're, they're tailored to the individual. Um, so they're not sort of cookie cutters or, or anything like that. So no. I would uh, have a phone call if that person's comfortable with that, a video call if they're comfortable or over email because obviously everyone's different. Some people don't like yeah. enjoying talking. You know, some people have quite, you know, quite suffer from anxiety doing that. So if they're happy over email. It's absolutely fine with me. Um, and I've got a bit of a questionnaire just so I can get an idea of what they like, how much time they have to spend on exercise, any injuries, their likes, dislikes. And that, that sort of helps me to start to put a program together that fits in their life in their lifestyle for things that they like because there's no point in me saying to someone who hates running right I want you to run 5k a week I mean they're just not going to do it they're just not going to do it so it's it's all about what someone likes what makes them tick and Mm -hmm. if they don't know what they like then we'll try loads of different things and see see what you know yeah see what they enjoy that's it's a woman across the road from you all she did was walking but you know what, what probably came hand in hand with that is she found something she enjoyed. It made her feel better. It gave her confidence. And what she probably did is probably changed the way she ate because that probably also made her feel a lot better. You know, yeah. she probably found when she, if she ate something that, you know, let's face it, there's lots of unhealthy food out there you can easily get hold of. She, she may be eating lots of unhealthy food and going for a walk and feeling a bit rubbish for it. But then if she starts to change the way she ate, she had more energy. So it all comes hand in hand. You can't say to someone, right, eat all this healthy food, do all this exercise, crack on. It's bit by bit, creating habits, creating things that people enjoy. Yeah. And that's certainly through all my 20s. I think every evening meal, it had some form of potatoes and half a can of baked beans every meal, <laughs> except, except on a Sunday we had a roast dinner. But now... I bet you I don't have one meal a week with baked beans. Not that they're bad, but just, and potatoes are probably less and less, although we still pack it up with either pasta or rice, but I'm trying to reduce that bread content, you know, stuff like that. So I'm certainly eating meat and two or three veg, you know, trying to maintain a colourful plate. But I think that's something I've had to struggle. You know, I was brought up eating chips and beans as a kid. So that's probably something I carried on into my adult age. So anyway, I made my thirties and I started to develop my sort of eating plans and stuff like that, it was just trying to bring them in slowly. And now I kind of, I don't mind veg at all. You know, I kind of, why have we not got veg? And like I just said to you, as soon as I've just finished my dinner, I just had an apple on the way up. You know, I'm conscious of how much crap I don't have. And if we don't have it in the house, we can't eat it. So certainly (laughs) Boxing Day, we were giving away stuff we had left over to next (laughs) door. Anyway, I'll take this with you. So we didn't have it in. One thing, nutrition, like you're saying, you, yeah. you choosing what you're eating. Some people don't don't know what's good. You know, you, you'll see adverts on the television saying, here, eat these cereal bars. Whereas actually, if you look on the back of them, they are just sugar. Mm-hmm. They are not healthy. Just because they're advertised as a, a wheat cereal bar doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that they're healthy. So one thing I do do um, with my clients is teach them about nutrition. Now, I'm not a nutritionist at all. Um, yeah. But I'll teach them that the, the sort of fundamentals of 
what is a good food and why it is deemed a good food, what ingredients to look out for, what ingredients to kind of avoid. Um, you know, baked beans, for example, are actually full of sugar. If I got you to read the back of that, see how much yeah. sugar was in there per, per <laughs> portion and got you to put that in a bowl, I think you'd be pretty shocked, like if you just spooned out the yeah. sugar, it's a way. Um, mm. You know, um, lots of different bits like that. So I do try and educate people there just so they can make better choices because I don't want someone to work with me for three to six months, finish, and then go, oh, God, I didn't learn it. I don't know what to do now. I literally don't know what to do. I want someone to finish with me, have all the basics, all their habits, have the knowledge to then carry that on without me. So, you know, there's certain plans out there, nutrition plans, where they don't necessarily give you that knowledge to carry on. They'll tell you what mm. to eat, when to eat, um, how many points or sins or, you know, whatever in there. But why do they have points and sins? Like, why? Just don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's in them that's given them those certain points, you know? Mm. this. How about you go there and you know what you're choosing to eat and why? Yeah. You know, know when, what you're putting in your body. Me and, uh, me and my wife, we met at a gym a few years ago and they were quite famous and they've made a lot of money from doing it. Locally, that is for doing these like 12 week challenges and they get Mm -hmm. so many people to sign up and it's so many hundreds of pounds. You get a free t-shirt and a nutrition plan. That's the same for you as it would be for me, as it would be for the next person, which, Mm -hmm. you know, those of us in the know understand that it doesn't work that way. And um, I quite quickly got bored of it because I don't mind going doing the hit training seven days a week, which was no good for me because my knee were just completely destroyed after about three weeks. But um, I lost so much weight because it was basically a calorie controlled diet, right. but it was quite a boring diet. So I was on this calorie deficit. I was down to about 1500 calories a day, which I think for the normal, normal man, is it about 200, uh, 2,500? Oh yeah. That's, that's quite a deficit. Yeah. So yeah. within, within probably two months, I got down to about 8% body fat. I was freezing all the time. Like I was, I was, I've never been a big guy. Like you can see the size of me now. I'm five foot six. I'm, I'm quite lean sort of thing, but I was like really ripped for me. You know, I've never mm-hmm. seen me look that good in a mirror, but I was freezing. You didn't feel, feel that good. <laughs> no, no. I looked nah. great, but didn't feel great. Um, and I, it's not really what wanted me to bring me onto this, but I've seen some of your photos on Instagram or uh, is it on your uh, website? You've gone through that sort of, working yeah. towards the body beautiful for contest and that which i know it's not mm-hmm. sustainable and they sort of cut for a while then you just bulk after that don't you and so on but how did you find that in comparison to what i've just talked about i found it so difficult so difficult and i think that puts me in a good position to help others to yeah. not go down that calorie deficit route and to you know do it bit by bit um obviously i did it for a certain goal um, if you don't have that goal, then you shouldn't be following something as strict and as regimented as that. Um, but God, it's, uh, being in deficit and getting down to body fat that low, um, well, for a woman, I got it so low that I didn't actually have a period on the last month. That's how low my body Jeez. fat got. And that can, that can happen to a lot of women. I don't think people realise what uh, women's bodies go through, and men's, <clears throat> excuse me, for those type of competitions. It was a challenge I set myself. I'm not the most confident person and I wanted to beat those demons and stand up on stage in front of all those people and go, hey, this is me, you know? Yeah. (laughs) But (laughs) you know what? I, I felt, as I was doing it, I had something to follow. I felt very weak. I was crying all the time. Like I said, my body just definitely wasn't happy, but I was going towards that, to that goal. Once I completed that goal, I had to come back really slowly and I found it was having quite an effect on my mental health because really? before I was watching the scales go down, 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 body fat go down, 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 numbing full well, that's not sustainable. You know, you're having your abs and everything like that. Yeah, great. Yeah. But to what now watch those scales go up, 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 knowing they're supposed to go up and the body fat go up was really mentally hard. Um, so I ended up taking the uh, taking the scales out of the house. I still don't know where my husband's hid them now after all these years. <laughs> um, but I, I I just couldn't cope with that. Um, yeah. And for that reason, with my clients, yes, we look at how much weight they're losing. 
but we are not solely focused on what those scales say because yeah. I realised how much of an effect they can have on someone. Um, mm. So we'll, we do photos. Uh, we take measurements like around the body and everything like that, the tape measure. Yeah. And also their fitness, so how they're, you know, if is their heart rate getting better? You know, how many beats per minute and everything like that. So there's lots of different ways we measure it rather than scale. And you know what? Not everyone wants to lose weight or gain weight. It mm. could just be more of a, a fitness thing, and that's just a byproduct from it. You probably just want to, most people just probably want to get to the top of the stairs without blowing. Exactly. If everybody is different regarding to yeah. what their goal is. Someone's yeah. goal might be to be able to walk to the shops without being puffed. Someone yeah. wants to get a little P PB. Someone wants to do their first park run. Someone wants to run a marathon. Everyone's goals are different. But mm. relating it sort of back to diving, I think your fitness needs to be at a level that you are confident enough that you could perform and rescue your buddy if, if you know, if stuff really did hit the fan. Can you cope? Because your heart rate is going to skyrocket. A, because of the adrenaline and B, because of what your body is now going to go through to try and maybe get someone to the surface whilst fighting a current and then doing a surface swim. You know, can you confidently say you have the fitness to be able to do that whilst you're diving if you cannot run a kilometre down the road? I think that's something people really seriously need to, to ask themselves. You don't have to be an athlete, but you need to be confident enough to have your body cope under pressure yeah i think a lot of us with skill fade you know you you go through an amount of training whether it be a two-week intensive course or something like that and then perhaps you don't retrain or re-practice or revisit that skill so mm -hmm. i'm trying to think the last time i did a rescue as in practice one let's say yeah. the summer I, I, i'm an instructor so I, I may no probably not this summer with covid but let's just say it was this summer so that's six months ago. Mm -hmm. And let's say we went diving in March because that's when lockdown might finish. And I'm on a completely different unit. Now I'm obviously diving a rebreather. My mate's diving open circuit. Is he going to know how to rescue me? Because we've not done it since then. Am I going to be able to rescue him? Because I'm perhaps not as fit. And that's, that's the skill, isn't there? So mm -hmm. let's add that then to the fitness. Or we're tax fixated because the boat's now further away and we're in a current and he hasn't seen us, it, it just becomes too much, doesn't it? So yep. if you can take one of them away and, and something like you said, add in a bit of routine to your day, you know, I, we're, we're doing this cycling lark at the minute. We're going out for an hour, trying to do it every other morning. And I'm, I'm a night owl, certainly not an early bird. This morning, my wife needed a lift to the MOT garage, eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. I was like, another five minutes. If at <laughs> half past six, she said, we're going cycling, I'd have been up or diving, I'd have been up like that at a shot. There's a so, motivation, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I can do it. I just need to. And that's where my hour comes from. I don't have an hour in the afternoon or an evening, but I can make an hour in the morning. And I get up, I'll, I'll have my porridge and a brew before, or as soon as I get back. I'm laughing then. The rest of the day is set up and I feel wired then the rest of the day. That sort of endorphin rush and that, which I guess a lot of people who haven't trained in any way, shape or form, don't understand that sort of natural high and smile no. that you can get from your day from kickstarting it somewhat yeah totally it's, agree. Um, it's a mad old thing so what are the some of the other added benefits to fitness within the diving industry other than you can save your mate or you're not going to flake out <laughs> i think that's probably come the big ones there to be honest with you yeah. <laughs> but um you know it could uh the more aerobic fitness that you've got it could reduce your breathing rate so your gas consumption will be better um yeah. you probably wouldn't get as tired quickly uh, or fatigue as quickly um, again it, you know some places I've dived like in the Galapagos it is it's a constant current so you know you don't want to be fighting against that current constantly and you know think oh you know what I've had enough of this I'm, I'm going up you know yeah. you're going to miss out on some of the most exciting things you've probably seen um, mm -hmm. you know good fitness can reduce your risk of heart attacks which unfortunately fortunately a lot of divers have um, have died from um, and something you were saying, you know, a lot of things to cope with, with new equipment and everything like that. It might, having that more physical fitness might delay that whole panic response, you know, because that's yeah. that's not entering it. You know, you're fighting a current, but you're not actually thinking about fighting the current. You're now thinking about what's going on with your equipment and what issues you've got with your equipment. So it's taking that 
element out of it. Mm. So I want to touch on there where you mentioned about heart attacks. I don't mm. think a lot of people, and certainly all my friends that I talked about, they don't know about this, but um, perhaps not at the minute when the NHS is stressed or stretched. But I've been going for about seven years now to my GP every year, about October, November, and they do like a, a well man clinic. And they say that because I'm the bloke that's going, but I, it could be a well person, well woman, well whatever you are, clinic. Mm-hmm. And um, so I book in with the nurse. She'll do like a height, weight, belly measurements and all that sort of stuff, room through my family history. I'm at, how am I feeling, you know, in myself, I mean, mental health. Then they send me for, oh, they'll send me for a blood test beforehand. So they do stuff like your liver function test, your kidney test, blood count, all them kind of things. So over the last seven or eight years that I've been going, they've been monitoring my cholesterol and, and watching it sl- slightly rise. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point where it, was, it wasn't danger high where they're going to start giving me a load of um, like medicine or something, you know, to keep it down. But it got high enough that they noticed that, that I needed to then make a change. And I think it was stuff like dairy, cheese was a big thing in my diet. I was adding it quite regularly. So I'd certainly have like cheese on whatever sandwich I had. I had cheese on it as well. So it might be tuna <laughs> salad or ham salad, but it'd have a handful of grated cheese on it. And then maybe with my dinner. So we'd have like a lasagna or a pasta, like a bolognese. So I'd throw a load of cheese all over that. And I was on, it could be getting like two or three meals a day. Most days of the week, I was having cheese, cut that completely out, started having less or, or the right kind of nuts, things like that that would help bring it down and eating more veg and more fibrous stuff. So I'd be having like a bran cereal or oats every morning mm-hmm. and, and have it with oat milk rather than just normal cow's milk. Just to yeah. try. And it did. The, the following year, I brought it down. I got, they want you around about the level of five, I think it is. I was up like 6.7. And they were like, Andy, you need to sort your life out. What are you doing wrong? And I'm like, just diet. It can't be anything else. But then added to that, I wasn't really doing a lot of sort of CV, like cardiovascular fitness, which would help obviously run that that blood through there and help sort of remove your cholesterol. So picking all that up, I've, I've sort of brought it under control. It's nearer to five that, that they would prefer it, but it's oh, that's just, good. just shite diet most of the time, I think. <laughs> It's always a combo though, generally yeah. diet and mm. and movement exercise. Yeah. Can I can I ask you um the difference? Because I don't think a lot of people will know this either. Aerobic and anaerobic fitness. And I'm not trying to test you because clearly you will know, but I think a lot of people don't understand why you would do one over the other. So, you know, do you want to lose weight or do you want to get like more endurance or do you want to be faster? That that kind of thing. Yeah. The- uh, trying to put it into quite quite simple terms really without getting too technical they kind of both use different energy systems so the aerobic fitness is uses oxygen um which divers will kind of want to focus on really um and that just looks at your air consumption everything like that i liken it to going for a run going for a walk getting your getting your heart rate up i'm not talking about a stroll but getting your heart rate up there using uh, your aerobic system to hit your anaerobic system um it's where you would do stuff like have you heard of like hit training stuff like that yeah. it's working to your near maximum or your maximum for a short period and then completely resting it out so we're talking about sprinters here so it's where the oxygen can't get to the muscles quick enough. So it has to use it from, from other sources. Yeah. Um, both are important to do, definitely, uh, because you might need a quick blast of something in diving. Um, but if you are starting out on a fitness regime, I would definitely go for the aerobic first, uh, just taking it long and gentle and everything like that, because a lot of the hit systems, so the hit sort of, types of training we're talking like can be quite now, vigorous yeah, yeah they can be quite vigorous um but I, I do a mixture of the two and everyone should try and do a mixture of the two once, once mm. you've got your aerobic system up to a certain level one plan we started to follow i i've been like I said, I've, I've run since i can remember since i was a kid but i had a couple of friends and one he packed in smoking just got married they were trying for a baby he had all these great plans and he, he's now like full-on does Iron Man's and that he's he's really gone far because he oh. could. Um, and we started. At, it was um, Q 
couch to 10K, something like that. And the program was you'd run for a minute or like, like a, a, a paced jog and then you'd walk for two. Yeah. Yeah. Def- yeah. Combination. I mean, I've, um, on my website, I've got a blog there and I've, I write the difference between aerobic and anaerobic and, and what the kind of difference yeah. is if you want more detail on there and what kind of sports each one. How do you think it relates to decompression? Um, injuries or sickness being fit there's a lot of uh, a lot of papers out there isn't there about fitness mm. and decompression I mean my opinion is you know DCS is all about you know bubbles in your blood gases in your blood trying to you know it's about your circulation so if you can have your circulatory system in tip-top condition it can only be beneficial it can yeah. my opinion is it my opinion is it can only lower your risk we were um, I was discussing it with a um, a previous guest a couple of days ago she's based out in sweden so they're diving really cold like mines and caves that's all she does and they never get any natural light on them so they're freezing cold all the time sounds great it, oh, yeah it does <laughs> that's why i spoke to her try and find out how she keeps warm so in the in these more sort of warmer climates here <laughs> i can just keep toasty but it, it whilst i understood what decompression sickness is and how certain things factors can contribute to it but so being cold is one of them only through that conversation did it actually occur to me that having cold hands or feet can be massive yeah. or create a massive rise in the likelihood because if you haven't your vessel shrink when, yeah when you get cold it comes out of the extremities the blood doesn't it that's why yeah. your fingers and toes get cold first and your nose but then there's still gas in that tissue that's going to be expanding and won't be removed Especially so, if you're really warm when you first go in, yeah. And as as you're coming up, or you're you know you've got cold on the dive, and now everything, all your extremities are getting cold. But you know they've been warm and been pumping around all that gas in there, but now it can't go anywhere. So the lesson to learn from this is don't dive when it's cold, kids. Yeah, well, that's why I'm a warm water diver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ace. So tell me more about your blogs. Um, yeah, some of them are related to some of the holidays that I've been on. Um, yeah. some of the articles on there are actually carbon copies of ones that I've written for, um, TDI, SDI, so bits yeah. and pieces like that on there looking at, you know, how even stuff like stretching can actually benefit your diving and um, people forget about that in their, ex- in their exercise regime. Sometimes I've been guilty of the same thing. You know, you want to go I out there, get your, get your release of running, think right done. Whereas actually yeah. the more you stretch, the better runner you're going to become, um, and stretching, you know, for diving. I mean, <laughs> yeah, my stretch is tying my shoelaces and then taking my socks off when I get back. That's terrible. So... That's terrible. <laughs> Although saying that, I've seen divers, you know, in places that I've dived, and they struggle to put their fins on once they've got their kit on. They haven't even yeah. got that flexibility, or even the flexibility to reach their own tank valve or reach wow. around to get their own piece of equipment. You know, it's yeah, like, it's quite scary to see sometimes. Um, mm. But also, a lot of divers get bad back. Uh, yeah, you're carrying a lot of equipment. It might be that you are overweight, so you've got a lot of lead around your back. Um, so stretching can also help alleviate any tension in your back, but also fitness and strength training can strengthen your core and probably help cope with that weight on your back. Or better still, lose some weight, lose some lead. So there's, yeah. there's so many factors that can come into it just to make your dive more comfortable. But yeah, so one of my articles is all about stretching and how that can benefit and different types of stretch you can do that can benefit your diving. Um, one, like I said, is about um, hit training or low intensity training. Oh, I can't remember what other ones are on there at the moment. Yeah. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I, I always up, sort of overlooked, um, oh, flipping it, it's just gone out of my mind straight away as soon as I started talking about it. Oh, your core strength. Yeah. I always thought this is well before, we're talking like 20 years ago now before I became a physical training instructor, I was about 26 when I became that. So I'm 40 now, but I always thought core strength was your abs and and having a good six pack. And now I've got a great core. So I'll just do loads of sit-ups and that'll sort it out. But it's so much more, isn't it? It's everything, the way you stand, the way you balance, the way you, you bend everything. If you, if you can engage them core muscles to do everything, it becomes easier. Yeah. I try, I, sometimes I try and explain it like uh, if you've got a, corset on you everything that corset is touching from the outside skin bit all the way inside that's all to do with your core 
you know, even Are you thinking about me back, wearing a corset? <laughs> so yeah, oh God, please say no. It. <laughs> don't give me, don't give me that thought. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it, it, it does make sense that everything around that there, but it's just mm-hmm. getting the right amount of training. And that's something I'm probably need to start looking at more now is, you know, I, I do sort of slouch a little bit when I, when I sit or, or certainly just lay back a little bit too much on the couch. A lot of problems and, you see as well is because of, like we said years ago, the, co- the core as well was always focused. It wasn't just you thinking it. I think it was always focused on the core just being abs. So people yeah. would constantly do sit-ups and overtrain their abs but in doing that where they're so where their abs are so strong it actually makes them stand forward slightly which Mm. overstretches their back constantly which puts so much stress on their lower back because they haven't strengthened their glutes or their hamstrings and actually brought themselves upright so they're actually walking at like a forward (laughs) angle constantly almost you know their abs and their hip flexors are just putting them forwards There'll be one of them divers gobbing off about people's posture in the water, wouldn't they? But they'll be walking <laughs> around like that, like lurch, lent over. That's it. Nice. Right. So if if people wanted to go about finding you on, you know, your social media or you, certainly your your sort of website platform, other than the fact that I'm going to put all the details in the the podcast description at the bottom, how could people find you? Uh, it's all the same, the Scuba Fitness Coach. So my Instagram is a Scuba Fitness Coach. Um, and my website is www.scubafitnesscoach.co.uk. Belting. Well, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for having it's me. It's been quite quite interesting for me to just chat stuff that I don't normally get to chat about because I kind of <laughs> left that world behind and I, I perhaps need to embrace it a bit more. And so does everybody else. Now, now we're in the new year. Right get then. Get out well, there. Take it easy. Do some movement. Enjoy it. Absolutely. <laughs> Right, thanks a lot, mate. I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. All right, take care. Bye. 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 Thanks very much to this week's guest for sharing their stories and interesting tales about the underwater world. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did recording it. For more information on this episode, take a look at the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram for the latest news. Thanks again to Northern Diver International and those of you who have supported me through Patreon. Take care and I'll see you on YouTube.